Well, hey, welcome once again to Stone Creek Church, and I'm excited to once again be speaking to you about this portion of Scripture called the Beatitudes that we find in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. And I'm going to invite you to, to once again read uh, these along with me, and we're going to every week just talk about uh, another one of these. The reason called the Beatitudes, they put two words together in English, uh, beautiful and attitude. They're called the beautiful attitudes or what some would call the heavenly attitudes. Uh, you notice that every one of these begin with the word bless or blessed. You could say that this is what it means to live the blessed life. He, I like what uh, how uh, one, one, one person puts it in regards to the blessed life. It is the favor of God that leads to a deeply embedded joy. And I think that's probably the best explanation of what Jesus is talking about here. Uh, these inner attitudes, if cultivated, uh, they remove from us the illusions in many ways that keep us bound. I'm always amazed when I read the Beatitudes on where we find the blessing of God. It's in places I wouldn't have looked. You see, you have mourning in here. You're going to see a list of of being persecuted and hated. I find the blessing of God there. I find it when I'm poor. It's in places I wouldn't have thought to look. So let's read the list again, and then we'll talk about another one this week. It says this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then it says this right here. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you, because of me. I don't think I would have looked any of those places to find the favor and the deeply embedded joy and the blessings of the Lord. But there's a bit of a paradox there for sure. I want to talk to you about this this week. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This week I'm when I was talking about that, I was saying it out loud in my home, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And one of my daughters said, Dad, what does a meek have to do with the kingdom of God? And I just had to chuckle and laugh. I said, no, not meek, but meek, which led to the question, what is meekness or meek? What does it mean to be meek? And it's, if I, the best definition I could give for meek, meekness, because often we think meekness equals weakness, but that's far from what the Bible's talking about here. When it says meek, it really means this. It means power under control or strength under control. Great power under great control. In the 1930s, in downtown Detroit, three white males get on a bus. And they notice that they're the only ones on the bus except for a African-American man who was slouching down in a seat uh, near uh, the middle of the bus. And they walk down the aisle of the bus, surround this individual, and begin to insult him, begin to call him names, uh, begin to make fun of him. And this went on for several minutes. When, after a period of time, this African-American man stands up. And then these three individuals realize that they have underestimated the situation because this man was huge. He was ripped. He was taller than they thought. Ever. And, it was, and it was quickly assumed that this was a man of great power, and he was. So as they surrounded him, now he reaches into his back pocket, and they're all wondering what he's going to pull out of that back pocket. When he pulls out, he hands the three of them a business card, never says a word. The bus stops, 
And this individual exits the bus to which the three men look down at the business card and it reads this, Joe Lewis, heavyweight boxing champion of the world. Whew. Here was a man, Joe Lewis, heavyweight champion of the world with immense power and capability. Yet in that moment, he practiced to the relief of those three individuals. He could have defended his honor and knocked them all out. It was said of Joe Lewis, I don't know how they figured this out, that he could knock a horse off of its feet with one blow. So here he was with great power. And yet in this moment, to their relief, he practices great control. Every year when I uh, take my sabbatical, uh, I, I listen to a leadership teaching by a great theologian slash leader who pastors a church in Calcutta, India, my, very close to where Mother Teresa did a lot of her work. Now, his name is Dr. Ivan Savarati. And at a global leadership summit with about a half a million leaders present, either online or in person, one of the greatest leadership summits in the world, he begins to deliver a and very potent teaching called the power paradox. And now out of all the leaders that day, it was the most interesting, it was the most profound, and it, it was delivered with such grace and humility as he talks about the power paradox. And here's what he says, that leadership is power. It is the power to change reality. And he talks about how over a lifetime we can accumulate power. But we must not be afraid of power because we can leverage power to bring great change. He also said that power is neutral. It's not inherently good or bad. It is the character and the motive and the heart of the leader that determines whether power ultimately is abused or is used to bring great good. In that conversation, in that leadership teaching, he talks about the ladder of power and about how as leaders we steward three areas of power. I'm going to give you the first two. He talked about knowledge power and about how as we climb the ladder of power, often we will steward and it has increased our level on the ladder by the amount of knowledge that we have and how we steward that. Now, I know today in the back of my mind, I'm celebrating uh, the graduates today, but I'm, 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 you're kind of my audience, whether you're graduating high school, graduating college, a master's level, or uh, a PhD level, all, all in between. Some of you are graduating summa cum laude. I mean, come on, you did it, and you did it well. Some of you are like, oh, laude, I mean, you need some help. You, you prayed your whole way through, but either way, come on, somebody, you graduating today. I want you to lean in as well because you have just increased your knowledge power. You have got an incredible education, a, a degree in a field of study that has increased your knowledge power. Sometimes when we're on the job and we've gained uh, knowledge through experience over a long period of time, sometimes we went and received training uh, to learn a new skill so that we could increase our influence on the job that we have. Either way, there is knowledge power. And as we climb the ladder of power, there's not just knowledge power, there's people power. Sometimes oh, we have... Uh, great people skills that give us a level of power. I once took a class for nine weeks on just how to have good people skills. Sometimes it's communication skills, the ability to communicate, deliver a vision, that, that will increase your power. Sometimes it's you've taken the time to cultivate a great network and you can, you can leverage that network for great power. No, uh, we shouldn't be afraid of that word, the ladder of power, that phrase. But Dr. Ivan goes on to say this, though, is that the power or the ladder of power is very revealing because some, as they climb, they will climb it in a very selfless way. Sometimes when we're climbing the ladder of power, we determine the worth of others and the, we determine our own identity, our own self-worth by where we're at on the ladder and how much knowledge power and people power that we've accumulated. And that is the danger of power. We determine dignity and self-worth. Now, as we talk about this I just want you to know that meekness is not our first instinct. 
Meekness is not our first instinct. In fact, our first instinct is one of comparing and one of competing. It's embedded in us. I mean, think about it as a kid. I, I'm going to run faster than you. I'm going to jump further than you. I can, I, I'm, I'm more intelligent than you. We're always trying to figure out how we measure up against all the others. And it seems like that it just continues into teenage life, into adulthood, and even into retirement. We're always playing this game, whether that is economically. Uh, I can determine my value, my dignity, my self-worth by a certain level of income or education level, or experiences, or relationships, or inner beauty. There's a, the, the social comparison theory is a popular theory that surmises this. If I feel like I'm better than you, then I, my, my, ident my identity and self-worth is positive and goes up. If I feel like I'm less than you, then what happens is my self-worth and dignity go down. Like for instance, if you're measuring your self-worth economically, Put yourself in a homeless shelter and you're feeling good about yourself. Put yourself in a room full of billionaires and you and suddenly you don't think of yourself so highly. See, this is something that we've all struggled with and the disciples struggled with it. Late in their time with Jesus, they're walking to Jerusalem to have the Passover meal and out of earshot of everybody, two disciples begin to have a conversation. In fact, they kind of pull Jesus to the side and they, they say this in, in, in the book of Luke, Luke 22, it says this, A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was going to be considered the greatest. As they begin to sense that Jesus was going to establish a kingdom, and they probably thought it was going to be an earthly queen, kingdom, not a spiritual one, they begin to jostle. Who's going to sit at Jesus' right hand? They're trying to climb the ladder of power in a very selfish way. And, and they are trying to move up this and see... Who's greater, you or me? I have a question. Where do you struggle with competition and comparison? None of us are immune to this, not even me. I'm a pastor. When pastors gather together, let me just tell on ourselves. We often determine our value and worth by how many people attend our services, how many services that we have, how many campuses do we have. And it's almost as if there's this unofficial hierarchy that begins to establish and, and dignity and worth is, is like, because I have more than you, I'm worth more than you, I'm valuable more than you, my opinion should be trusted more than you. And if we're, um, that's, just you, that's just what we as pastors struggle with. But I think every profession has this, and every one of us struggle this in some way. So, let me ask you again, where do you struggle with competition and comparison? What are we determining our dignity and self worth and our value on? And let me just say, that's always our first instinct. But let me tell you the reality of Scripture before we drive this home. The reality of Scripture teaches a very different thing. First is this, is that we are made in God's image, endowed with inherent dignity and worth. Think about that. We are made in God's image, and therefore we are endowed inherently with dignity and worth. Now, there's a situation that Jesus, he gets water baptized. It's early on in his ministry. And the Bible says when Jesus comes out of the water in Luke chapter 3, that the heavens open, the Holy Spirit descends and rests upon them in the form of a dove, and then a voice comes. And everybody around him hears it, and it says this, This is my Son, whom I love, and in him I am well pleased. Now, truth be told, this happens twice in Jesus' life. The second one, first at his baptism, second at the Mount of Transfiguration. But two times God repeats these phrases. You're my son. I love you, and in you I am well pleased. I've been thinking a lot about that today. I think it's so important for the father to say this about the son. Think about this. It was a relational identity. You're my son. It was an emotional identity. I love you. It was an inherent identity. I am in you, I'm well pleased. Because at this point, Jesus has performed no miracles. He's given no great sermons. He hasn't preached the Sermon on the Mount. There's nothing outwardly. He's still living with his parents. We have no indication that, that Jesus has done anything great, wealth-wise, education-wise, economic-wise. I mean, but the Father says, you're my son. I love you. And in you, I'm well pleased. There's a psychological theory called the looking glass theory that says that we will ultimately become 
what the most important person in our lives think we are. In other words, our value and worth will be determined by who or what the most important person in our life, whoever that is, whoever we deem that to be, thinks about us. So think of it like this, is, is the whole world could say we're great, but if that one person says we're not great, we'll believe that over the whole world. My question is this, what if God was that person? What if he was the looking glass? You're my son, you're my daughter, I love you, and in you, I am well pleased. Here's what, in fact, I want you to type it in the chat or if you're with somebody, just turn to them and each of you take a turn and say this phrase, I am made in the image of God, a person of dignity and worth. If you're not with anybody, type it in the chat. I am a person made in the image of God, a person of dignity and worth. I am made in the image of God, a person of dignity and worth. And that's the reality. No matter where I find myself, knowledge power, people power, way up the ladder, in the middle of the ladder, the bottom of the ladder, it doesn't matter. Because I'm made in the image of God and I am a person of dignity and worth. So what do we do with this? How do we move towards meekness if our first instinct's not right and now we have this new reality. How do we move towards meekness? We have to embrace a new posture. And that means this, I honor the inherent worth in others. In fact, I'll say it this way, the path of meekness is the path of humility. In fact, let me say it like this, college graduates, listen in. As you ascend the ladder of power, here's the paradox. You descend in the path of humility. You ascend with power to the ladder of power, but you descend in the path of humility at the same time. And that is, according to Dr. Ivan, the power paradox. Because in Jesus, get this, you have absolute power coupled with absolute humility. Jesus is the example. Now, in response to the jostling and the, and the, and the, uh, the, the, the attempt to selfishly jump over one another on the leadership of power, Jesus does something significant. And I close with this, a new posture. It says in Luke 3, 25, Jesus said to them, he said, the kings of the Gentiles loaded over them. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For greater is the one who is at the table or the one who serves. It is, it is not the one who is at the table, but I am among you as one who serves. Jesus, same scenario in John 13 says this. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet you also should wash one another's feet. Because what Jesus has done here is in the context is this meal that they were getting ready to have, the Passover meal. Jesus sees that no one's washed each other's feet. The servant of the house didn't do it. So Jesus goes to the lowest position, the lowest rung on the ladder. He takes towel and a bowl of water and does the unthinkable. He washes their feet. He takes the path of humility. The disciples say, you can't wash our feet. And Jesus says, I have to wash your feet. I am among you as one who serves. And listen to what he says. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Wow. I have set an example. Now go do it. It's beautiful. It is. This is the best picture of meekness. Absolute power coupled with absolute humility. Climbs the ladder, descends at the same time. So how do we do this? Let me get extremely practical with you today as we move towards meekness. Let me ask you two questions and make a statement, and then we'll be done. First is this. Now think about this before you answer. Who do you consider yourself better than? And before you say, 
nobody think about it. Pause. I want you this week to take inventory. Maybe it won't be immediate, but it is going to be true. There's going to be a scenario or something. Who do you consider yourself better than? If you don't believe me, uh, how about Cubs fans? You think you're better than Cardinal fans? Ooh, how about Bears fans? You think you're better than the Packer fans? I'm Tessie. I told you. We all struggle with it. Let me think about this. Let me bring it more home. Maybe you think you're better than people who don't have a college degree. Maybe because you're young and you have this new skills and you're more technologically savvy, you think you're better than older leaders who are not as savvy. Or maybe you're older and you have all the experience and you think you're better than the ones coming in. Or maybe I've seen this play out in marriages. Uh, there's somebody in the marriage who thinks they're better than the other person in the marriage. Sometimes it plays out in a, in a gender way because of your gender, you think that in this job or in this place, in this meeting, it inherently makes you better than the other gender. Or sometimes some of us come from countries with caste systems and you think you're better. Or tribalism is something you face and you think you're better. Or you come from a background that taught you that you're better than another race and you feel like you're better. Or you feel like that for some reason, because you have more wealth, than everybody else in the room, that you should be heard more and you've afforded certain privileges because you're better. You see, this plays out in a whole lot of ways. May I suggest to you, as you discover who you're better than, who you think you're better than, I want you to intentionally find ways to disrupt the power dynamics on purpose. Because Jesus did the unthinkable he descended to the lowest level position. Disrupt the power dynamics. Whenever you see the power inequalities, seek to equal them and let them out. How does this play out? I listed a few. Often in meetings, your position of leadership dictates that you sit in a certain spot. Don't sit there. Let somebody else sit there. Maybe you've inoculated yourself and it's been a long time since you've invited any feedback. Be a leader who invites feedback. Here's another one. When it comes to eating the food at a place and your age and sometimes your position dictates that you go first, but you go last. In fact, why don't you go around the table and serve the food? Here's another one. Uh, you often, in, this relation, in the relationship dynamics, you're, you hold all the control and you make all the decisions. Everybody always defers to you and you're always right and you got this. Let somebody else to make the decision and you live with it. Uh, when it comes to giving your opinions, give yours last. In fact, find a way not even to give your opinion, but just to listen. Or maybe it's an apparent relationship and you can give them options and let them choose. Or maybe when you speak, you get down on the level and look at them eye to eye rather than up above. You get down low and look eye to eye. There's so many ways that you can change the power dynamics. Second question I have is this, which is harder for you to serve or to be served, to serve, or to be served, or let me say this, to receive, or to give. Some of us, because of our positions, are receivers. We're always being served. We always are given directives, and people are doing our bidding, and, and there's just a lot of, uh, we've accumulated a lot of power, a lot of influence, and because of that, we, we get to to even sometimes influence people in what they do and they, they serve the vision that we've created. If that's you, I wanna encourage you to do one thing this week. I want you to find the job in the workplace, on the team, in your home, in your marriage that nobody wants to do, to make the coffee in the morning, to do the laundry, to do the dishes. I want you to do, I want you to find that job. Then for one week, every day, I want you to do that job. And listen, when you do it, don't complain about it. And I want you to do it with joy. I want, I want you to do it as you descend on the path of humility. Now, if you're the givers, though, you're always the one helping, and you just give, 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 give. And in fact, I think sometimes that's a subtle form of pride. You could never be in a place where you needed something from someone. If that's you, 
I want you to find a chat task and ask for help. Even if you don't need the help, ask for the help. Humble yourself, be vulnerable, and ask someone to help you. And then lastly is this, that mantra that we said at the beginning, I am made in, in God's image and therefore a person of dignity and worth. I am made, made in the image of God, a person of dignity and worth. I want you to make that a prayer mantra and I want you at least three times a day, morning, noon, and night, I want you to find space for five seconds, 10 seconds, and I want you to pray that to the Lord. I am made in your image, and therefore, I am a person of dignity and worth. This is what we're talking about. This is what Dr. Ivan at the end called kingdom power. Absolute power coupled with absolute humility so I close with this, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Let me say it like this, my power comes from God and will be used to build and not destroy. My power comes from God, that's what the meek realize. My power comes from God and I will therefore use it to build and not destroy. And that's ultimately why God can give them the earth because they will use it to bless and not destroy. So let's turn humility into prayer and let's humble ourselves and create a sacred moment where we're at, bow our heads and close our eyes. And I want to just give you a moment to, to pray. You've heard the word of God as we move towards meekness. I want you now, I'm speaking to two groups of people. First, I'm speaking to those who've yet to receive Christ. Listen, the, the beautiful thing about this is, is that God gives grace to the humble. You receive God's grace when you humble yourself before Him. I love that too. Repent in many ways is just to humble yourself, acknowledge your sin, realize you're wrong, and that you need Jesus to forgive you. And, that, and if you're here and you've never done that, or maybe you've wandered from the Lord, and you need to humble yourself and turn away, and turn away from that and come to the Lord. This is a moment right here. Humble yourself and pray a prayer of surrender. All that you are, all the power and strength that you have, submit it to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and say, Jesus, cleanse me to forgive me. Wash me from my sin. And as you're praying that, let me speak to the other side of that coin. I want to speak to those who are in Christ. And, you, and, and, and this message is speaking to you today. I want you, maybe... First thing when I was thinking about this week is I have some repenting to do. Maybe you just need that you do consider yourself in many situations better than others. Or maybe you've determined your worth by your position on the leadership ladder or the ladder of power. Repent. Repentance is a good thing. It's an invitation to receive the grace and the help of the Lord. And then I want you to invite the Holy Spirit. Invite the Holy Spirit the spirit of power to help you walk in the path of humility. It's one of the fruits of the spirit. In other words, you can't do it on your own. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you now to not climb the, the ladder of power, but to descend on the path of humility, to begin to see the inherent worth, the image of God and all those that you lead. Your children, your teammates, your coworkers, your students. And then lastly, I want you to pray that prayer now, maybe for the first time. Come on, let's all do it together, that, that mantra. I am made in the image of God, a person with dignity and worth. Father, thank you for these words. Seal them upon our heart and may they bear their intended fruit. In Jesus' name, amen.